Our root scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astounded, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood. But before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. I thought we were done with sweaters. <laughs> Me too. I really did. But here I am wearing a sweater because I'm cold. Been cold all day. <clears throat> Had to be out at the cemetery this morning at 8.30. Judy Justice has got me on one of these historical seminary walks, I, or cemetery walks, and I, I'm supposed to be the last surviving uh, last surviving Civil War veteran. He died in 1938. His name was Samuel John Croft. And um, so I've got this whole speech in my mind. You're not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go out there this morning. And ever since then, I just can't get warm. But on the way home, uh, I was listening to uh, the radio, and one of the radio shows I like to listen to on Saturday mornings is a show called The Moth radio hour, and it's a storytelling hour, and it goes all over the country, and they invite people to tell stories, and it's not famous people, literary people, it's people like you and I that they have stories to tell, and they, they take these, and they put them on. Uh, once in a while, they're up in Ann Arbor, I've often thought it'd be sort of fun to go up there and, and uh, watch the, the storytelling. And a young woman that was telling the story today was telling the story about her dream of being a flight attendant. And when she got out of school, she applied to become a flight attendant. And uh, she got her application accepted, so they sent her to flight attendant school, this airline. And at the school, she was so excited and so thrilled, she thought the idea of just jetting all around the world, serving people, 
She was a very bubbly personality, very, 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 you could just tell by the way she was telling the story. She sort of had that infectious personality. And she says, it was so great at the, at the flight attendant school. Uh, the president, CEO of the airline, came in and talked to us and said, you know, uh, uh, we can teach you how to evacuate a plane. And we can teach you how to uh, uh, apply first aid. And we can teach you how to handle difficult problems on the plane. But the one thing we can't give you is the one thing you have, and that's why we hired you. And that was a smile, and that you're nice. And then, the, then she says, that just made us all feel good, all of us flight attendants there, and flight attendant school, and I just felt like all oh, the whole world was waiting for me. And, and then he said, uh, so I want you to all go home and tell your mothers thank you for doing something to you that I could never do, make you nice, give you a smile. And so she said it was the whole experience of flight attendant school was just delightful and she couldn't wait, she just couldn't wait to get her wings and get out there and, 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 and serve people on airplanes. And then she says, you know where the story's going, don't you? When I started the job, I discovered something about people. They're not very nice. <laughs> And she told this story, which is awful hard for me to get my head around. I mean, I know people cannot be nice, but this story was just so out there. But I believe her. I believe her. I think this is conceivably possible. When they were on a flight, uh, one of the passengers had a heart attack. And so they laid him out on the floor in the aisle of the airplane. And they were getting the paddles out to shock his heart. And she was holding the canister of oxygen, trying to revive this this man, and all the time she's on the floor working with this man with the other with the other flight attendants, there's this woman sitting in the seat next to her, pulling on her 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 suit, her her, her uh, dress or whatever it was, you know, just kept pulling and pulling, and pulling, and said, "Bam, bam, I need you." I need you. And, and she says, "I kept telling her, just a minute, just a minute." I, I, I gotta take care of this. Just a minute, just a minute. This went on and on and on. So finally she gave up and she said, Yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? And the man, this woman held up a cup of coffee and she said, My coffee's cold. <laughs> and she said that was the lowest point when she discovered that uh, people are not always nice. People are sometimes so wrapped up in themselves. I chose the phrase intrusion to speak about the Holy Spirit. The wonderful little video beforehand talked about it as a gift, and I believe it is a gift. It's a necessary gift for us. Because I think it can be, the Holy Spirit can be an intrusion to us because one of the paradoxes of our faith is that what our faith expects of us is counterintuitive to what we are. We tend to be, as human beings, self-protective. Our faith wants us to be hospitable and generously caring of others. And that's a paradox. We tend to want to take care of our own needs. Our faith is always pushing us to watch over the needs of others. Our uh, nature, our human nature, has a tendency um, to make us want to hold on to things. And our faith is always encouraging us to give of ourselves away. And so, at its core, Christianity is sort of counterintuitive to the way we human beings by nature seem to be. 
And on that airplane that this woman was describing as she was trying to revive this man with a heart attack, here's this woman trying to tug at her uniform, wanting her to get her a new cup of coffee. While well, she and her colleagues working desperately to save this man's life, as difficult that is to imagine, we've all been around long enough to know that, uh, yeah, that could happen. That could happen. And so you have the first Pentecost, which uh, Dax so wonderfully shared. You know, uh, this is one of the harder lessons to read because you got all those names in there. And I think I told you this last year. Uh, but when I was at Southern Hills in Kettering, I had this fellow in my church. His name was uh, Merrill Leatherman. He was my building superintendent. He was a great, great guy. And he could fix anything. And he's always around. And he had good humor and good nature. And that particular Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, he was the liturgist. And he got up to read the second chapter of Acts. And he came to that paragraph with all those different hard words of describing all those different cultures. And he just paused. And he looked out at the congregation and he said, and there was a bunch of people there. <laughs> I just... I, I, I just, I just laughed. What could you do? But here you have, in this culture, all these different ethnic backgrounds of people, all these different nationalities of people. And for this one moment, when the Holy Spirit makes itself available, they're all on the same page. They may speak different languages, but they all understand each other. They may have different cultural practices, but they respect one another. This is just not something that happened in the first century. And you know, it doesn't happen very often in the 21st century either. What made that possible was this, this mystical, mysterious, wondrous Holy Spirit that Jesus promised the disciples. That when it got a hold of all these people, they became family. And it didn't make any difference what language they spoke, in what country they came from, and what practices they participated in. They became family. And at that first Pentecost, the church receives its vision. to be family for the world, to be a place where folks from all different walks of life and professions and traditions can come together and be family in a safe environment, to be loved and cared for, and to learn how to love and care for others. And again, that is so counterintuitive to who and what we are. So the Holy Spirit can be somewhat intrusive, pushing us to go places we may not be comfortable with going, becoming something we may not be quite comfortable becoming, exuding a spirit and a hospitality that we might not feel. Spirit is this wondrous gift, it can be intrusive in our lives. Intrusive, and I think, in a good way. Because from time to time, we all need a little nudge in life. We just do. Because of our nature. I am always amazed when people who have not been attending a church How much guts it takes, 
how much courage it takes to walk into a worshiping congregation for the first time. Nobody knows you. You don't know them. You got all those strange worship practices. Even though we've been doing this for 2,000 years, each congregation has its own in its own little characteristics, in its own little ways. It's just an amazing feat, I think, when somebody decides they're going to go to church and walk in off the street. You have to have a whole lot of spiritual curiosity. You have to have a whole lot of desire to choose a course in life that is grounded in this holy mystery of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. I just think it's an incredibly hard, hard thing to do. I've done it a lot. Time I got sent to a new church that first worship service. I can remember my wife and I sitting out there in the car as we pulled up on that, that Saturday night in June, two years ago, for my first encounter with you. And you know, I'm a traditional guy, so I was really nervous because this contemporary praise stuff was just sort of foreign to me. And I was really nervous and really scared. I'd fall flat on my face. I'd do something stupid. I'd say something stupid. I probably did something stupid. I probably said something stupid, but it didn't make any difference with you. Well, I understand that. That's why it's so important that we in the church keep our hearts open spirit, to overcome that human nature to sort of stand back and withhold and pass judgment and be careful and be cautious. So when somebody wanders in vision. 